Today I'm driving a Volvo 240 GLT. Not G and T, G and GLT, it's different. Before I start talking about the car, I just want to quickly tell you about this great wallet that Exeter have sent me to try. It is a multi-function thing. First of all, you can hide up to five cards and reveal them with a push of a button. Secondly, it's RFID shielded, so no one's going to skim your wallet and fraud you on your cards. And thirdly, you have a solar powered tracking card, which you can push a button on your phone and find the wallet with. You can get yours by hitting the link in the description below and that would just be really nice. They also come in many colours, like red myself. If you ever wondered where Volvo earned its reputation for big, safe, boxy cars whose buyers cared more about practicality, safety and that kind of stuff more than, say, economy and handling, look no further than the 240. For nearly two decades, this was the face of Volvo. Between 1974 and 1993, if you thought antique dealer or caravanner, you thought one of these. And the boxy design wasn't completely original. It was a follow-on from the 140 series, which is also designed by the same man, Jan, or possibly Jan Wilsgaard, who was Volvo's chief designer from 1950 to 1990. That's 40 years at the head of the penmanship of the Swedish company. In fact, this car survived with only one major facelift in 1983. That was a year after the 700 was released, the car that was intended to replace it when the car was pushing 10 years old. But in fact, this went on and outlived the 700 series. So the styling really did just transcend generations, going from the 70s to the 80s and actually into the 90s, and everything else was becoming more round and aerodynamic and jelly moldy. Even its replacements were becoming rounded and moulded and aerodynamic. This thing just stayed stalwart and resolute, boxy and square, and the people who loved it absolutely adored it. They kept on buying it and buying it, despite being replaced twice. The people still loved this, and Volvo kind of eventually had to tell them they couldn't have it anymore. Let's have a look inside. Now this is the posh end of Volvo travel. And before we go any further, I will say, if you hated my gray cap in the, uh, I think it's Austin 3 litre, you're gonna loathe this one. So good luck. Now Volvo offered quite a range of trim levels on the 240 series, starting with the DL or Deluxe, which of course was the lowest one because Deluxe is always the lowest one. Following that, there was the GL or the Grand Lux. Then we had the GLE or Grand Lux Executive. Then we reached this one, the GLT, Grand Lux Touring, which has quite an impressive spec, which I'll come to in just one second. And finally above this, there was the GT, which was replaced by the Turbo in later years. And of course, the special editions like the Torslander, which I think the owner of Ikea had until he died last year. Now the GLT spec was pretty luxurious. Looking across the cabin, we have got most creature comforts you are going to want apart from air conditioning. The, starting as always on the right, we have got electric windows all round, electric rear windows as well, which I am very impressed with. I'm also rather a fan of these, uh, well it looks like a corduroy pattern but it's actually a kind of a velour, corduroy velour door cards with very very sturdy door handles, another sturdy door pull there and a couple of door bins as well, this thing is rather practical. And speakers, because, you know, luxury car, got a radio, centre of the dash. Moving on to the dashboard, we've got a nice array of air vents, so we've got good ventilation in the car. Predictably clear and legible dials, uh, a taco, speedo, and then temperature and fuel gauges, and a few little warning lights underneath there. And everything's very square, everything that isn't round is square, which may sound like an obvious thing to say, but there are very few circles in this car. The gauges are round, and everything else is very angular. Even the trip reset button is completely square. The air vents are very square. The gear shift is a big square block. It's like something from Minecraft. Now across this very big and slightly off-center binnacle, we've got our headlight switch off, side lights dip. Above that, we have a fog light switch on a rocker, and then a little dimmer switch, a rheostat perhaps, for the, uh, ouch, for the dials. And to the left, we've got a nice Volvo quartz clock, and we have, fitted by the owner, not a standard, an economy meter, a Volvo economy meter. I do like that. It's interesting, the uh, slightly oval egg-shaped surround on these otherwise circular uh, dials. And we've got space for the radio, which has been updated, and a couple more vents. And we have a quite handy little tray, ideal for, for coins and pens and sweets, perhaps, I don't know. Moving down from here, we've got a useful lighter socket, 12 volts for your modern things. Hazard warning lights, very easy to find, a rear screen heater. And because Volvo, 
the biggest thing on here, a big red warning light, so that if you turn the car on and don't have your seatbelt on, it'll flash red at you all the time and you'll not forget to put your seatbelt on. Or else. Ah, put your seatbelt on! Over the years, over the, over the 146,000 miles this car has covered, the steering wheel has worn a little bit smooth, but it's a nice size, it's not adjustable, it does have a melodious horn. Now below that we have an absolute delight of heating ventilation control. The little tags you push are attached to kind of rotating wheels that disappear into the dashboard with light up coloured bars on them. They are absolutely fabulous. They're obviously very basic to make, but they are just a really, really pretty and inventive way of doing things. Pretty and silly is always good. And of course we've got our fan controller, ordinary boring, and a big cubby hole below that, ideally sized for many, many CDs and our big Minecraft headed gear shift. I believe this is a um, three speed with overdrive and kick down AW71 gear shift or gear gearbox. And obviously a regular unexciting handbrake. And then very excitingly next to the handbrake we've got heated seats because, because Sweden is very cold and you need heated seats in Sweden. So we've got them on the GLT and the most curious little tiny square blocky joysticks you've ever seen for electric mirrors on both sides, a separate control for each one. Isn't that fun? Now, finally on the dashboard we have, well, first of all we have a large indent so you can put small items so they won't fly off. Well, they will fly off obviously the moment you go around a corner. It's going to be going out the window if it's open. But beneath that we have a good sized glove box with not only one T-shelf cup holder, we have a second T-shelf cup holder and a vanity mirror. This is quite unusual because there's no mirror up here on the sun visor, but there is one down here on the glove box. So at least you can put your makeup and things somewhere whilst you're doing your makeup or whatever you're doing with a mirror in the, the glove box. And finally on the front, we have got a manual sunroof. Can I open this or is it gonna break? Yeah. <laughs> Oops. I won't leave it open for too long because the rain has been quite hard today and I'm fully expecting it to come back quite soon. But there we have sunshine on a cloudy day. I think it's a song by Zoe, isn't it? Yes. Yeah, I, think so. I, I would sing it to you right now, but first of all, you wouldn't like that very much. And second of all, I'd be done by copyright infringement. So I'll just maybe leave a link to it downstairs. It's a really good song. If you've not heard of it, then I'll put a link down. It's really good. You'll like it. It's from off of the 90s. And the 90s, as the last video said, was the best decade ever. And one final thing while I'm still sat in the front. This car has got original moulded rubber Volvo all-season winter mats, which I don't know how hard an accessory they are to find um, these days, but they are a wonderful thing. So you can go stomping through the snow and mud, climb into your luxury Volvo and not ruin the carpets. What a wonderful thing to have as an accessory. Right, let's go look in the back. Ah, this is more luxury and more comfort. This roof line doesn't drop at all as it reaches the back window. It's really boxy, obviously, being an old Volvo. So you've got tons of headroom. And in fact, the metal comes well behind your head as well. So if there's a rollover incident or broken window of some kind, this would still be protecting the rear occupants very nicely. You've got a rear armrest and I believe a ski hatch in there as well. Well, Volvo were the inventor of the seatbelt. So there are three seatbelts here in the back because that's their thing. Um, there were, when it was new, rear seat headrests, but there are now massive speakers instead, because you know, if you're not taking many people in the back, that's more fun. Now, the doors themselves have little to describe. We've got the lovely Cordroy Velour, the unusual little handles, which don't kind of intrude into the cabin at all. They're slightly awkward to use, but otherwise are quite nice. And of course you have your electric windows because electric windows, yes. And again, very, very sturdy door handles. You've got big, big pockets on the back of the seats. And this is one of my little favorite things. Down here, obviously you've got your, put your seatbelt on light, big ashtray. And down here we have a dimmable puddle light. Oh, isn't that cute? Which actually comes on and off with the side lights of the car and is dimmable on the instrument panel rheostat. Let's take a look in the boot. Now this boot is cavernous. Hello, oh, oh. There could be a herd of elk or reindeer in here and you'd never know about it. Probably. In fact, I do believe that Father Christmas doesn't live in Greenland. He lives in the boot of an old Volvo. 
to one side you've got a full size spare wheel covered in carpet so you barely know it's there. I guess it's, this is from sort of 1960s cool design. You've got a split level floor boot. Uh, so the nearer to the back of the car you are, the lower it is. And as you get towards the back seat, it rises up about that much. This is actually because as well as the massive extended crumple zones built into this car for, for passenger safety, the fuel tank is above the rear axle. It's between the rear wheels, away from any potential impacts. So it's the most safe position that they could find to put it. It's actually not a new idea. The Rover P6 was doing it in the 60s. That's vertically behind the, um, the rear seat, but that does mean your boot is smaller and you can't have a hatch through from the boot. So this is kind of an evolvement of that idea. Also, here in the back of the car, we've got the electric antenna. I love an electric car radio aerial. They're such a cool 80s item. They do find a little bit more storage space hidden away on the spare wheel well on the right hand side. So you could either have two spare wheels if you're going very far into the snowy wilderness of Sweden, or you can have hidden stuff like jump leads and tow ropes and bits and bobbies you don't really need that often. And look at these hinges. These are a masterpiece of cantilever design so smooth to use and they take this big heavy boot lid and make it extremely light. Early days for this kind of accessory but look a fuel filler cap holder for when you're pumping gas or filling with petrol if you're British. Right let's have a quick look under the bonnet and then take it for a drive. Under the bonnet is Volvo's B230E 2316 cc or 2.3 litre straight four engine which is a tough old mule of a motor putting out around 130 horsepower we think. There were various engines used in this car, including the B20, the B19, and the PRV, which is shared with Peugeot, Renault, and more importantly, the DeLorean. So your time machine has got a Volvo engine in it. Now, notably, this car has got Bosch K-Jet Tronic fuel injection, the same as my Mercedes W123. The difference here is this works. Do you think you'll notice if I uh, borrow it? Do you know what? I think I probably could nick that. <laughs> You'll notice how massive this engine bay is and how much space there is around. This is partly because there's room for the V6 and the straight six. Also because there's the crumple zones, but it just makes it so easy to work on. There's the fuel filter just waiting to be changed. Here's your distributor. Here's your battery, all your, everything. It's just right there in front of you. Working on this car must be an absolute doddle. Now, although it's a very, very big car, when there's oncoming traffic, you don't feel too concerned. You kind of have a feeling like you're in a chieftain tank and even if they do hit you, you're not really going to notice. That's my first overwhelming feeling of driving this car. I, I could almost do it with my eyes shut. Not because it'll drive itself, it just won't notice the stuff you've hit. A lot of the underpinnings in this car came from the 140, but obviously developed as the 140 had been from the Amazon that it replaced. So it's got McPherson struts at the front, it's got trailing arms and apparently gas filled shocks on this model well, as opposed to oil filled as in the rest of the range. It's got disc brakes all round, making it quite a modern feeling car and in the 70s this was extremely modern. The GLT apparently has slightly lower riding suspension than the other models, the lower models I should say. And on this nice country road, the car actually rides fairly smoothly. Wow, this looks narrow. Well, this feels like a heavy car when you're driving it. You can certainly tell from the way it sits on the springs and goes around corners that there's a lot of mass being controlled by those suspension components. And uh, that's also reflected in the fuel economy, which sometimes ventures into the low 30s, but most of the time is about 26. But surprisingly, if you do dab the brakes, they feel really sharp. The steering's incredibly accurate. You can point it with real precision wherever you want it to be on the road. It's not the kind of car you can flick into a corner and pump the throttle and flick it out with a dab of oppo. The gearbox just isn't that kind of thing for that. But as a lazy cruiser goes, when I say lazy, it's got kick down, so it will go with a bit of a burst if you hit the, if you mash the pedal. Okay, bad example. When you shut the door, the door rubbers just seal so tight you can virtually submerge this car and it wouldn't leak. This really feels like a well thought out car, like they've put so much time into making this just an easy car to live with. Things like this little clip up here for putting your parking tickets behind. The ventilation is very easy to use and it's volcanically hot when you put it onto full heat. 
this is such a great winter car. The heater is just so lovely and with the heated seats on as well. This is perfect. This is this car is Christmas all over. It's kind of a, a cliche for, for Scandinavia and Father Christmas and you know all that kind of Christmassy stuff, but yeah, put a roof rack on and go and get a Christmas tree in this thing. Perfect. There's nothing more welcoming and more homely than a Volvo. And this is about as homely and welcoming as it gets with its lovely snug warmness. Ah. The car this heavy has obviously got power steering and it's rack and pinion as well, hence the fact it's so nice and tight and accurate. You couldn't move it without any kind of power assistance. It's just way too heavy a motor. But the weighting they've put into it is just right. It's not overly flighty and light. It's just a nice, good weight to it. And the thing that really gets me about what is clearly the build quality of this car is the fact that this is, well, I said 146,000 miles, apparently the odometer gear failed for 16,000 miles. It's actually got 160,000 miles on it. Everything feels tight. There's no rattles anywhere in this car. Nothing feels like it's loose. The trim isn't falling off. It's just amazing. I said earlier, the kind of people who would buy a car like this were more concerned about practicality, safety and security rather than things like sporty handling and uh, MPG. And we've already mentioned the MPG and the handling, surprisingly, isn't particularly roly-poly. It's actually quite connected. It doesn't give you the feeling it wants to be thrown through a corner, but it does stick to the ground. <laughs> Now this gearbox is the AW71 automatic. It's a three-speed with overdrive, making it a four-speed, plus kickdown, so you can launch the car relatively quickly. That's 50 miles an hour without even noticing. This is a proper heavy-duty cruiser. It's the kind of car you could just relax into a long journey in and you know, okay, fine, you're not gonna have great B-road blast fun taking it to the Evo Triangle and swatting it around tiny corners. If you're driving all the way from the bottom of Sweden or Norway up to the top of the Arctic Circle, you can just sit back, you should take in that right turn, and enjoy the ride. Because it's a great cruiser. It's something you, you can just let the car do the work. It feels safe, it feels secure. You kind of know that if anything does go wrong, the car will look after you. But because the car is also really well designed and thought out, the suspension is brilliant, the road holding is excellent. The chances of it going wrong aren't that high. The visibility is just immense. The A and B pillars are quite slim, so you've got amazing visibility. The rake of the windscreen is almost vertical, so combined with the uh, virtually straight up side windows as well, you can see so clearly out of here and because it's a big box on wheels, you know precisely where your corners are as well. It's a car made to be driven. Driven sensibly, but driven nonetheless. Right, we have just done a quick pullover to move our cameras around. So now let's see if we can do a naught to 60. Are you ready with the counter, everybody? One, two, three, go. 20, 30, 40, 50, 55, chicken out because of a corner. <laughs> okay, it's relatively brisk. I recently drove a 240 DL and I was astonished at how painfully slow it was. This is a completely different animal. Yeah, compared to the DL, this is actually a firmer suspension setup. So going around the corners, there is a slightly smaller amount of roll. Now, when I was buying my Mercedes everyday car, I was giving serious thought to getting one of these. I was looking at a later Torslander estate. The only thing that stopped me going for it really was the fact that I couldn't find one with air conditioning or cruise control. Because aircon and cruise control were only available on the American market cars, I guess because they demand that kind of stuff harder than we do, and on the 262C, which is also obviously based on this car. Now there's a car I want to review one day. 
for a daily car that put me off. For a retro, I think that would be fine. And as a retro usable classic, this is just perfect. You've no, no worries about safety of putting kids in the back. You've got tons of room for, for days out and camping and picnics and bikes. You name it, you just throw it in here. This car is really good. One of my favorite facts about this car is that it outlived both of its successors. First one by 10 years, second one only by a year. But the fact is that 20 years or 19 years in production is just unheard of in the car world. Not these days anyway. And because maybe it was in production for so long that you do still see so many of them around, or because they were so well made as well, it doesn't maybe strike you as being a special or classic car, but the fact is, the earliest ones are now 45 years old almost, which is quite elderly for a car. And the newest ones are, you know, 20 odd years old. It's almost an antidote, the clean lines and simple boxiness of this is a wonderful refreshing change from the overly styled many 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 lines and curves and swoops and sharp angles on everything you see today. It's like a palette cleanser and a mousse bouche of a car. Now quite often when you drive a car from 20 or 30 years ago that you remember as being a big car you sit in it and look at it and think actually this isn't very big anymore. This car I sort of did a little bit but it's not really the same. It's not like driving like a Sierra or a Cavalier, which you thought was a big car 20 years ago, and then you look and think, actually, it's only like a Focus these days. This still feels like quite a big car. Well, thank you for watching. I hope you've enjoyed this little dose of Swedish loveliness, this little Volvo meatball nugget of reindeer sauce and your dire life or something. Yeah, hope you enjoyed it. Thanks for watching. I'll see you next time. Like and subscribe and that stuff. Goodbye.